I can tell you one thing about this praise team, that they are making it harder and harder to follow each and every week that goes by. Thank you so much. I wish that, uh, well, let me put it, put it a different way. My pride is restraining me from taking my boots off on holy ground because I don't want you to see my holy socks. So uh, that's, a, that's the reason for that. Uh, <laughs> I think my socks are. I think, but me, myself, I got a ways to go. Uh, wow, wow, wow. I'm going to tell you guys, I told everybody in Sunday school this morning, that I'm excited about today. I'm excited about today's message. I'm excited, in fact, that the Lord, His Word is new and, and to us every day. It is alive, and we know that it cuts to the quick. It exposes everything that is not of Him. And I think, I'm so thankful for the fact that we have this today uh, and have it before us, have it to lean on, have an open channel of communication with our Lord and Savior at all times. And we're going to see that um, very thing. So as I am sort of doing an introduction here, uh, we, can we can basically go back to where we started in this season of fasting. Uh, and so today is the conclusion of that 21 days. You made it. We're going to enjoy all 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I am uh, I'm surprised I didn't hear a bunch of amens and stuff like that, but I mean, hey, you know. Uh, but this being the first uh, season in quite some time that we've gone through a season corporately of fasting in some form or fashion. There's a part of me that I'm just like, you know, all these benchmarks that <laughs> were floating around up here, and there's not a lot, not a lot of room to float. I'll just let you know, not because of brain matter, just because of skulls like that thick on each other. But anyway, not much room to move in there. But, you know, you sort of set up things that you anticipate. And I love it because God says He just knocks them down like dominoes, you know. So and that that's not necessary. What do you even have this on here for, you know? Just like we saw in the book of Isaiah, the fast that I've established, the fast that I desire, doesn't have to do with all these, you know, check marks and things like that that you put up there. He desires a relationship, a drawing ourselves unto Himself. That is what fasting and prayer is all about. We saw that last week as um, Jesus told us about the three things that not if we do, when we do. And that was praying and giving and fasting. Those disciplines that we need to incorporate and just because we're at the end of this corporate fast doesn't mean that there won't be seasons to come in the excuse me, in this year that we won't need to take some time and say, Lord, this is so important. This is of such concern to me that I want to designate this time, whatever it may be. It may just be a day that, Lord, I just want to get everything stripped from me and be prostrate before you and communicate with you. Because I'm going to tell you, and we're going to find out today as we go through this lesson, God is listening. So again, like I said, we'll be in Daniel 10 today. This is a major undertaking for me. Um, I was telling, I was joking, I had like five pages of notes right here that only goes to verse 12. There's 21 in the chapter. So, I would say pray for me, but let's do that corporately before we start. How's that sound? Father, thank you. 
for giving us the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, thank you for redeeming us. And Lord, thank you for our hearts that you've sown within us that lead us back to you Sundays and Wednesdays. That we may give of ourselves and our time in our admiration and adoration of you. Lord, I pray that you would strip down this flesh. Lord, that what would be left would be a clean vessel to be able to be used by the Master for an honorable purpose. And I pray that the Holy Spirit would pour Himself out upon us today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. So as we... probably should have turned there myself, didn't I? Uh, as we are in Daniel, remember we started utilizing just a portion of Daniel 10 when we started our fast, and then we sort of leaned heavily on Daniel 1 uh, in starting this process. And I, I mentioned this earlier in Sunday school, but I think it's worth repeating. You know, I've had some other pastor friends that have people, they're far more seasoned than I, I am, and ever will be, I believe, that they mention that they have people in their congregation that have, that have been in and around God's Word their entire life. And yet, there's, there's times when he's preaching and teaching that they just look at him like a calf at a new gate. And his question was, how is it possible that they've lived their life for God and in God's Word all this time and never heard this? And like I said, there's a portion of me being a, is not young in years, but at least young in the, this pastoral role that I, like, man, this happens every time I open God's Word. And I thank God for it. There are seasons that you can read through God's Word and it's just white pages, black letters, some red. And you just get through it and you're like, man, I didn't really get anything from this. And then there are seasons when you open God's Word, maybe even the same passage that you've read, three, four, half dozen times, if not more, all of a sudden it's like a big neon sign is just glaring. You've got to put on sunscreen because it's so bright and so vivid and so real before you. And I think the one thing we miss, the one thing we forget, is God's Word in and of itself is truth right there on the surface. But when the Holy Spirit illuminates Scripture for you, it's time to pay attention. When the Holy Spirit brings about, I'm not saying a new revelation, but He makes you aware of what is already revealed through God's Word, your ears should perk up. Because there's something that that particular verse is going to have application in your life very soon. Now, I'm not using that as an excuse for us to go through God's Word. And if we're not picking up what He's laying down, we don't just say, well, I'll just wait till the Holy Spirit illuminates. It doesn't, no, it don't work like that. <laughs> because in those seasons that we may think is dry, those times when God's Word really isn't profound for us at that moment, even then, we are just storing we are filling up the storehouse of our soul. And there will be a time and a place when God has called you to open your mouth before someone or in a situation when words will come from it 
And the recollection will take place that you have no idea how to explain other than it is the time you put into God's Word, the time you put into prayer, and the power of the Holy Spirit. We are going to see that in full effect today. To let you know where we're at here in Daniel 10, Daniel 10 is sort of the, the prelude or the opening of the last, the fourth and final vision given to Daniel. We see that take place in chapters 10, 11, and 12. 10 is the sort of the opening. 11 and 12 are the actual prophetic words that are administered to us. We won't be going into 11 and 12. We're going to keep our focus in 10. But I just wanted you guys to know that aspect of what it is that we are delving into today. One of the other things that we'll see, the vast majority of all of Daniel's visions had to do with mainly God's chosen people. However, we have seen and we will continue to see as time plays itself out that everything that has to do with God's chosen people affects Gentiles. That's us, just in case... If you look around, like, man, I didn't even know I was hanging around Gentiles. You know, we, we all are. <laughs> and thank the Lord that we are deeply impacted by what God pours out upon His chosen people, good or bad. We are redeemed to be a witness to God's people who did not realize or did not see Him as the Messiah when He came the first time. But as we studied in, this morning in Matthew 24, when the second time He puts His foot on the earth, we will know without a doubt, without a question, that big neon sign will be Christ Jesus. So we have that to look forward to. Amen. And what we're going to see here is that if you continue to read 11 and 12 later in your, in your time, uh, this is a massive span of time we're talking about. Most prophecies that we see have a meaning and a, a direct impact on the people in and of that exact time. And then prophecies also reach out into the future. And what, we've see, what we'll see in... Well, if, like I said, if you study 11 and 12, you'll see that that time frame impacts us now, impacted them then, impacts us now, and will impact believers and non-believers alike in the future. These things go all the way from the Seleucid Wars, which will take place not long after this time frame Daniel is in now, um, all the way to the desecration of the temple by Antiochus Epiphanes, there you go. Write that down. And also includes a character that we have come to know as the Antichrist. So that is a massive span of time. One of the things that we'll also see as we go into this, this word and as we see going from here until the New Testament is what... Uh, we, you hear people talk about, in certain circles, the 400 silent years. So from the time that this prophecy of Daniel is given to the time of Jesus Christ's birth, there is a time frame of about 400 years there that no other books were written. No other revelation was given. And you're looking at, I know y'all are looking at, if you've, especially if you've got the tabs in your Bible, you're like, hold on just a second. Sure, there was, there was six other books written before the New Testament. What we have to understand, our Old Testament is not in order, if that makes sense. If you go back and look at the, the, uh, uh, the Torah or the, uh, the Tanakh or the Septuagint, depending on which version that you would go back and read. 
they are not ordered like our Old Testament. All the books are there, but they are not ordered as we have it. There's a telling, a retelling. Prophets in between, a retelling. Those kind of things like that take place all the way leading up to its very end. But these 400 silent years, some people in the Protestant community uh, would consider that the intertestamental period. And then our brothers and sisters in the Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic Church would call it, let me hold, hold on a second, push my dentures in, the deuterocanonical period. Now don't ask me how to spell that. <laughs> All that to be said, there was no need from this point to the, the birth of the Messiah to write anything else down. It's all given to Daniel in these visions. It's all proclaimed to God's people through this prophet Daniel. And it plays out, we've seen it played out, and we look back at it as, okay, that's history now. And then we look forward to some of it that it was given, and hey, that's our future. But guess what? There's parts of it that impact us here today. So as we close out this season of fasting, we're going to go through Daniel, uh, the Daniel 10 here, and see him fasting for a peculiar purpose. And we'll start here in verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message and had understanding of the vision. What we have to know is we, or I say we, as we read the chapter prior, Daniel was given a vision then as well of that period that we look at in end time prophecy that we call the 70 weeks. And it's confusing for us today. There are biblical scholars all over the world and throughout time that have argued and disagreed with one another about what that exactly meant. And, uh, and there's a lot of views on it. However, we see right here in verse 1 that Daniel knew that the vision was true. He knew there was a great time span in which it was going to play out. And he understood the message and had understanding and comprehension of the vision itself. Now, that right there is not only impressive that he understood it, but it's, under, it, it's, it's impressive that he did not fold under the weight of it. One of the things we'll see here that uh, this is the third, at the very beginning, this is the third year of Cyrus, uh, the king of Persia. And we have to understand that at this point in time, this would put Daniel approaching 90 years old. Remember when he was first brought into captivity in Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar in, in chapter 1, he was only 16 years old. This is, a big, this is a span of time in and of itself. And because of the precedent that he and his three friends made in chapter 1 by saying, hey, we're not going to eat of these foods from the king's table. In our belief system, we have a dietary law that we're going to adhere to. Put us to the test. And if we remember, after 10 days, they were in better condition than their contemporaries. And we see here, and we will see here, that Daniel didn't drop that discipline of fasting whenever they proved their point way back then, all those years back. He kept it up. 
which may be one of the very reasons why God chose him to be able to communicate with and to document these prophecies that we adhere to today. One of the things we see there, like I said, this is uh, being the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. This was 536 B.C. I don't know if our, 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 our calendars on our iPhones go back that far, but the other thing that we need to see is that he has, since his mid-teens, he has served as God's vassal under four different rulers. Nebuchadnezzar, which we already mentioned, who had laid siege to Jerusalem and conquered it and uh, ended up destroying the temple, the first, the, 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 and ended the first temple period. Um, again, his successor was Belshazzar, which was also a Babylonian ruler that came after Nebuchadnezzar. And as predicted in the Bible, got through, uh, in God's Word, Babylon was conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire under King Darius. So that was the next ruler that he served. And then at this time, we see him serving in this third year of, in the court of King Cyrus. And he was a king, also king of the Medo-Persian Empire. One of the things I find so fascinating in the midst of this as we um, delve into this book, Cyrus made a declaration. Actually, he actually wrote the declaration that said not only would he give the captives that came from Judea he would give them the opportunity to go back. He would also finance the reconstruction of the temple, bringing on the second temple period. And what is so amazing about that, if you go back and look at Isaiah 44, 28 and Isaiah 45, 1, that God, 200 years prior to this, called Cyrus by name and said that he would use him as an instrument to set his people free and rebuild the temple. 200 years, ladies and gentlemen. Unbelievable. And Cyrus is just like, oh, I'm, I'm just doing this because I'm Cyrus the Great. Not even realizing that he's being used by God for good. I love it. I love it. We're going to see here that Daniel normally writes, in the, especially in his visions, in third person. So when we read this, don't think this is another author outside you know, dictating this or putting this to pen and paper. This is uh, just Daniel's way of um, declaring these views, these visions that he's being seen, that, that he's seeing. And so, for that prophecy that took place of the 70 weeks in chapter 9, he said he determined it to be true. He realized it covered an immense amount of time. The message was made clear, and he had a full comprehension of his ramifications. And because of that, we see verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. So when we see this time of fasting that we're in corporately as being 21 days, this is sort of where we get that from. However, if you're in the middle of this time, this season of fasting, and you have not been touched by God in some way, He has not, he has not measured your steps, led you, provoked you, or empowered you through, by the Holy Spirit, you may need to go a couple more days. There's, there's no set time. We will see why there's no set time here in just a minute. And we will probably, if by looking through this, we would know that Daniel wouldn't have stopped at 21 days if the other events would have unfolded as he did. And 
And this morning that we see here is probably, there's three reasons, possible reasons, why he is in such a state of despair. The first one is the stark reality of what was to come in the future for God's people. And because of that, it sent him into a state of heartbreak and mourning. He saw that what they would, in this future vision, what, they, what would transpire in the lives of God's people, His people. Secondly, although uh, Cyrus' decree gave full pardon to all the captives of Jerusalem, only 42,360 people returned back out of the hundreds of thousands that were in captivity. That small remnant is all that chose to go back. And that was followed not long after by 7,337 servants and 200 singers as sort of an encouragement and a help and an aid to those original ones that left. So they were just shy of 50,000 people out of all the hundreds of thousands. Historians determined that it was only 80%, or let me rephrase, only, that 80% of the Jewish people stayed under the rule of Cyrus and those that came after. And unfortunately, under the influence of their Persian captors. And we can... We can see that he would be heartbroken over that. That God has delivered a man that he said 200 years ago would set his people free. And not only set them, set them free, but he would finance the whole operation to go home and rebuild. And they said, no, nah, we're good where we're at. And that probably broke Daniel's heart. And then lastly, out of those few, that remnant that went back, it wasn't like, even though they had a few dollars in their pocketbooks uh, to be able to put towards rebuilding this temple, they were being opposed on all fronts. From people mocking them as they worked and they told, to raiders coming in, and invading them and taking and stealing and plundering to just the hard work and labor being more than some could bear and they were all just despondent beside themselves, discouraged. So in all these cases, pick one. He had a lot of reason to be in this season of mourning. And because he was in this season of mourning, because it weighed so heavily on him, in verse 3 it says, I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. He took this time to go into what he started as his discipline, as his approach to setting himself apart for God, for prayer and communion with Him, he restricted himself from the things that brought him joy. Three weeks of not bathing. There were no inside jobs back then, guys. I don't know if y'all know that or not. They're in a desert, arid climate. That's pretty rough. And as we'll see, he's going to be sort of out of his element in a place that he's not normally at. And that may be because of the stench. We don't know. Verse 4, Now on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, that is the Tigris. Now, it t this, this just, I read it and just rolled off. Didn't even think much of it until I realized that, you know what? The seat of Babylon, the capital 
even under the Medes and under the Persian rule, was upon the Euphrates River. He's 50 miles away from the capital on the Tigris River. Maybe he determined, you know, Jesus from time to time in his ministry would pull away from the crowds and spend time alone. You know, getting all the, the noise and the distractions out of the way. And maybe that's what was taking place here. He says, you know what, I'm going to go on a camping trip and go from this river to this other more secluded river to have alone time with God. Verse 5, it says, I lifted my, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to pass on some of these. What we need, there's also, there's also information that we need to understand because of the 24th day of the first month. This is the ecclesiastical calendar we're talking about. This is the month of Nisan. Nisan, some, some, some may say, depends on what part of Keyfield you're from. But of the 21 days he's fasting, now we're in the 24th day, so he's almost an entire month fasting. But in the middle of this, this is why I say he, he determined himself to not take part in the things uh, that would bring him joy, bring him pleasure. It was more so than just food, more so than just not bathing and those kind of things like anointing himself with oil and those kind of things like that. He missed four Feasts during that month. He missed. Uh, he missed the. the uh, I'm sorry. The tenth, the presentation of the lambs, leading up to Passover on the fourteenth. The feast of unleavened bread from the fifteenth to the twenty-first. And the Feast of First Fruits that was on the 16th day. He missed all those. There were some of these that are in this. Remember, remember God's Word said that His, his people, had to, every, every, every able-bodied man had to participate in three of those feasts. Gather your goods up, no matter where you're at, head to Jerusalem. Take part in this. Well, there was no Jerusalem. It was destroyed. But they were still taking, picking that up and celebrating it, and they, Daniel did not in the midst of this. The, one of the things that you, I find particularly neat about verse 4 is that he remembered what day it was, what month it was, and where he was. when these events unfolded in his life. Are there things like that that have taken place in your life that are impacted you so strongly that every detail around you at that time are just clear even today? There's a couple of those I can think of myself. I remember in my eighth grade year at Broadmoor Middle Lab School, um, that would have been uh, in 1986, January, ended, um, 1986. Sitting in class, as kids do, they had just started back then. You young ones probably don't know what a cathode ray tube television is, but it's a hum I mean, the screen isn't as big as this, but it, it weighed like a half of that would have been like the weight of a bus. It was huge. We had them things somehow hanging in every corner of home, our homeroom, and I think it's channel one or I don't remember what it's called, but they would play some kind of indoctrination for the school kids at that point in time. That particular morning, we were watching the launch of the space, space shuttle Challenger. And I don't know, I can't remember my own name half the time, but Krista McCullough was the, yeah, the first teacher to ever be a part of the space program to go into space. And this was taking place during that launch. And I remember us watching, and we were just like, you know, yeah, that's cool, I guess. And then a, a few seconds in, it exploded. All lives were lost aboard that vessel. 
And it just, I can remember it. I can, I can remember every part about that. Same thing happened years later on September 11, 2001. I remember I worked at a what we call a tank farm for Probex fluid recovery back then. And was going into, I'm going to call it my office just to sound cool, but it was basically a portable building. <laughs> out there in that tank farm, just just got in there, sat down, turning the news on. Well, that was what I did for about the first hour every morning is do paperwork and listen to the news playing and all of a sudden this breaking event took place. And four planes. We didn't know the circumstances at the time, but in hindsight we knew that they were hijacked by terrorists. Two of those planes hit the World Trade Center. One of those planes hit the Pentagon. And later we were to find out that the passengers of the fourth plane resisted and that plane crashed in Pennsylvania. And I remember going through that day just thinking, is this a hoax? This, this, this can't happen in America? This is the United States of America. This can't happen here. But it didn't just affect me profoundly. It affected the nation profoundly. Do you remember the weeks after that, the months after that? Churches were filled to the brim. People were beating down the doors. I wonder if an event happened like that today, if that same thing would happen. I wonder if an attack, a major attack on this nation was to take place. Have we fallen so far in that amount of time, what, 23 years now? Have we fallen so far in that amount of time that we would choose God? We would run to God? Or would the nation as a whole just twiddle their thumbs? Or have we become so desensitized to news like that we wouldn't even, even think to run? So we can see how Daniel can have event, an event like this take part in his life and he says like, oh my goodness, everything that, I, that took place I know and I've documented. Verse 5, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with the gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sounds of his words like the voice of a multitude. Yeah. I'm going to tell you right now. I think I would remember that. I would think I would remember that. A lot of commentators look at this and say, well, that's the pre-incarnate Christ. I don't know, I have a few issues with that. We'll discuss that in a few verses from now, but I don't know if I buy into that wholeheartedly. Although, we see that very same description in John's Apocalypse, the book of Revelation, in 1, 13 through 16. It's almost verbatim of that description of Christ. So there's arguments for and against this uh, basically, without turning there, I'll just I'll read this to you. It says, And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Sounds a whole lot like what we're dealing with here. One of the things that we'll see is uh, his response 
Daniel's response was a whole lot like John's at that point in time. We'll pick that up here. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, this verse 7, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them so that, men, that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and, my, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of, uh, the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. If I saw something like that, I would faint and fall forward just like he did. There was a part of me that was like, you know what, maybe this positioning, I should play this out, you know, but I'll be honest with you, if I got on this floor face down, I don't know if I'd get back up again. So, that being said, you can imagine, you're sitting here, you see this vision, and almost in a cartoonish style, you just, you're toast. Fall forward. Wake up with a nose on the side of your face. But we've seen this multiple times when God or one of His heavenly creations has presented themselves to man. John, like we mentioned before in Revelation, we see Daniel, we see Isaiah. Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And we see Ezekiel, and there are other occasions as well. We also see something very similar to this as far as the friends, those that are around him, in Paul's Damascus Road experience. They just sat there dumbfounded. They could hear, but they couldn't make out. These that were with Daniel... And you've got to remember, he's part of the king's court, so he probably had an entourage around him to make sure he was stayed safe and that kind of thing like that. They bolted. Skedaddled. Terror, it said, filled them. And left one, Daniel. Verse 10, we see something take place. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my, on my knees and on the palms of my hands. So he went from being face down to being touched. And now he is shakily on hands and knees. There's something about this response that we need to pick up and adopt in our lives when we go before God. There is a reverence whether we submit or whether it's forced upon us, because we know his book says every knee shall bow when we come before him. I believe every bit of this is without Daniel thinking it. The flesh is forced into submission, but his spirit will be revived. And we'll see that as we continue to read. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. I think every bit of this is in the Spirit. I don't believe for one instance that the flesh would be able to withstand the holiness that was before him. Whether this was Jesus Christ pre-incarnate or one of the heavenly hosts. Verse 12, he says, Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for I am, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Did y'all catch that? Daniel fasted 21 days to this point. Daniel's prayers were being answered. It was in the works day one. I want you to know that when you go before God, your prayers are heard. Do you know that, as we read in the book of Revelation, that within the throne of God 
are the prayers and the tears of His saints. Every one, every one is within that bowl. And you want to tell me that we serve a God who doesn't care? We serve a God that would turn a blind eye to His people? Let me tell you, those same bowls that come from that bowl are what's poured out in wrath back upon this earth. Justice will be served. Just maybe not on our time frame. We're going to go back to 12 because that's sort of where we're going to close. So keep an eye on that. Because there's some aspects of that we need to draw from in as we learn from this season of fasting. Verse 13, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to, to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. I hear some gears grinding, a little smoke coming from some ears now. And this is why I do not believe that this is the pre-incarnate Christ. Because what opposition, what created being could oppose the Creator? The God I serve doesn't have weaknesses like that. Notice this. He was on his way from day one. And as soon as he got to Persia, there was opposition. Now guys, this is starting where it's going to get sort of... I don't, want to, I don't want to downplay this, but... This draws awe for me. I'm one of those that tends to live my life that, you know... Everything that I do or what, however I serve God, you know, I'm in control of and all that kind of stuff like that. But a lot of the same aspects and characteristics that Satan himself has, pride mainly. We don't live our lives as Christians in most cases where 24 hours of the day, 7 days of the week, we are in an understanding that there are battles playing out in the heavenly realms that we are part of. That there are those that fight on our behalf from heaven. And there are those that fight against us that belong to Satan. We'll get into some more of that in a, in a, in a moment. But one of the things we need to see here. The other thing that, that like I said, makes me feel that this is a, another angel, not... Uh, the pre-incarnate Christ, as Michael, notice his, his label there, the chief of princes. Michael is an, what we call an archangel. He has rank. You notice there's only three angels within all of Scripture that, have, that are called out by name. Michael, Gabriel, can anybody guess what the third one is? Lucifer? Those are the three. And what we need to know, what we need to be very aware of, that they are all creations of God. They are not on the equal plane as God. Yet there is a hierarchy. There is a ministry that each one has. Satan himself had one. Well, technically has an anti-ministry right now. But he had one when he was part of the heavenly hosts. He was a chief musician. He led worship. He was a master of all instruments. The other thing I want us to look at here, how many days do we wake up in the morning and wonder
which side of the heavenlies or or the which side of the angels the ones fighting on God's behalf or the ones fighting on Satan's behalf have dominion over the United States Russia China Louisiana Keithville Can we see the evidences of it? The ebb and flow back and forth? I think we see most of it ebbing. We have a part to play in that, ladies and gentlemen. Verse 14, Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. When he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face towards the ground and became speechless. He is under the weight, Daniel is under the weight of the prophecy that had been given to him already in chapter 9. And now he is about to see, it is being delivered unto him, the weight of what is to take place in the prophecies in chapter 11 and 12. And again, the flesh fails. The spirit inside of him is still attentive. The spirit inside of him is still listening, but the flesh is just given up under that weight. Verse 16, And suddenly one having the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips, then, opened, then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. This is my understanding, my comprehension, and this is, this is coy. This is a man giving my understanding of what we're looking at here. One of the possibilities is that there are more than one of these beings. If that is Christ uh, pre-incarnate before him, above the waters, because remember he lifted his eyes to see that being, there at the banks of the Tigris River. Then he says, one having the likeness of the sons of men is the one who touched him and restored him. These are declarative clauses, this one being singular, independent. So it makes me wonder if it is not Christ if, it is, if, that, if this is the pre-incarnate Christ, then there is an angel with him that is ministering to Daniel in these three times that he is touched and restored. But again, Daniel's sorrowful, he's overwhelmed. It's too much to bear in the flesh, yet his spirit, his spirit is retained. Verse 17, For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me, no strength remains in me now, nor is any breath left in, to, in me. How many of y'all had siblings growing up? Especially older siblings. You know? How many times during your life at home did that sibling scare the mm, out of you. You know? Pulling one prank or another and just scared you that sometimes you come around the corner and you really think your flesh and your spirit separated. You know? Like one of them Tom and Jerry cartoons where he just falls out and the Holy Ghost just comes, I mean, the spirit just comes up out of him, you know? He's saying, man, look. Somehow, I'm standing here before you. Somehow, I'm having a conversation with you. But it's not because of the flesh, I assure you. Because it's coming and going. We're flatlining one minute and getting our hearts jolted back into us the next. Verse 18, then again, the one having the likeness of man touched me and strengthened me. Here it is again, referring to that particular one. This is 
the, uh, him being touched. And he said, O man greatly beloved, fear not. Be, peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Now, one of the things, this has already been mentioned before, the same term, O man greatly beloved. That word in Hebrew, uh, y'all you know, know I don't, I'm from Keithville. There's no Hebrew in me. Kalmad is the term. And it means sought after, precious, desired. This angel, if it's singular or both in two, in two uh, individuals, the pre-incarnate Christ and this angel, is saying, look, there's no harm that's going to befall you. Look, did I not just tell you that I've been warring back in Persia to get to you? Do you think I'm going to make it all this way to do harm to you? No. You're beloved. You're cherished. You are precious in the sight of God. One of the things that we can note here is because of the surrender that took place in Daniel's life that on day one, as soon as those words were spoken, a plan was put into action. Ah, that's, no, that's not right. That's theologically not right. However, an action was put into place not because of his surrender, but who God had created him to be to have that humility and that surrender before him. And he's like, look, we've got a big plan played out. I'm revealing it to you and you are going to reveal it to my people. And because you are living and utilizing the characteristics that I bestowed upon you when I knit you in your mother's womb, because of that, I'm coming to the rescue. Because of my love for you, I'm coming to the rescue. Man, do you think that's what drove Jesus during his ministry all the way to that cross? I'm coming to the rescue. Be strong. Let that hope carry you. Let it strengthen you. Verse 20, Then he said, Do you know why I've come to you? And now I must return to the fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. Wow. Do you all know that Greece is not going to come on the scene as a superpower for another 200 years from this point. He's not even, not even trying. <laughs> He's given prophecy. He's like, look, we're going to go out here and we're going to finish this, this fight. We're going to take out these princes that are under Satan's dominion that have dominion over these regions, they're coming and going. You saw Babylon, we brought them up, we, we made them fall. You saw the Medes rise in power, we made them fall under the Persians. These Persians, in two years, they'll be out of there, they'll be old hat, then you'll have the Greeks. And it makes you wonder, what forces were under, was Rome under, that would come after the Greeks. And again, what forces have played, them, played, that played out over the years? Think about it. Germany, North Korea, The Viet Cong, 
Iraq. Think about all the turmoil and the fighting that we've seen during our years. What side were we on? What side was controlling our opponents? Who won in those circumstances? But I will tell you what is noted in, script, in the Scripture of Truth. That is the vision that he gives Daniel for 11 and 12. The truth. Not that it's brand new. God has already been revealing this from the dawn of time. But he's going to make it to where it is going to fill the gap of that 400 silent years that we talked about earlier. No one upholds me against these except Michael. Look at that. Your prince. Who are you aligning yourself with? Jesus talks about in his earthly ministry about do not, do not cause these little ones to flee from me. That they have angels, plural, before them, before God at all times. Did you ever think about that? That you have angels specifically designated to you. And as we see right here, they join forces from time to time in certain circumstances. And we sit there and we, we throw our prayers up like, Lord, like a slot machine. Lord. I hope this revelation, I hope what we've seen here the comprehension that we take away from this season of fasting that Daniel has taken, his, his broken spirit for what he sees his people going through. I hope we adopt that. It will not be until we do, until we... Uh, not only adopt that, that heartbreak for those that are lost, that heartbreak for our brothers and sisters in Christ that are going through turmoil and struggle and strife. And we implement those disciplines that Jesus taught us in Matthew. Through those, we engage with the, spirit, with the spirits that are fighting on our behalf. In those, in that seasons of repentance of God's people, whether it be the Jewish people or the Christian people today, it's only during those times of repentance and heartbreak over our actions and our deeds and our words and our lifestyles that that tide turns in that fight. If we go back to verse 12 in closing, what we see Daniel demonstrate here, we need to add and hone and sharpen these skills in our own lives. We need to set our hearts to understand and humble ourselves before God. Humility. I think I mentioned that last week. God doesn't force humility onto His creation. As Derek Prince said, He will, 
He will force humiliation. It's up to you to decide to humble yourself. God gave us that ability and free will to choose. I can't tell you how many times, how many years of my life I spent whoo, defining the term stiff-necked. But God is relentless. Those two things, guys, add earnestly to your discipline. Seek every day to understand more about who you serve. And that comes through this. Whether it's one of those days where it's just black or red words on a white page, or it's those days where the glare is overpowering. Be diligent to seek Him out. And live your days humble before Him. And His love will come before you say Amen. There may be some obstacles on the way to get to you. Those are why I was saying Daniel ended at 21 because this particular angel came before him on the 21st day. But if I know Daniel and read after reading this book, he would have stayed there in that state until he drew his last breath or an angel showed up months, years later. Sometimes unanswered prayers are answered prayers. Mm, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank You for this opportunity to be in Your Word. I thank You for the example that we're given in Daniel. Lord, the knowledge that we know of through Your Word that Daniel wasn't the only one that's precious and beloved and sought after in Your sight. Lord, we thank You that Your love is so strong and so great that it could reach through our stubbornness and our wickedness to redeem us. And Lord, that You gave of Yourself to place Yourself, hum humble Yourself in the flesh to live out a life on this earth sinless. To place Yourself upon a cross and shed your life's blood to redeem us. And Lord, to give us the hope that the grave is not the end as he rolled a stone away and walked out, conquering death. Thank you, Father, for your immovable, unshakable, love for us. And Lord, as we're in prayer before you, Lord, we call upon your grace and mercy during this time. There are some here today, Lord, that may have a heavy heart, that may be carrying a burden, that may have an issue that they need to present before your throne. And Lord, I pray that they would take the time, whether where they're sitting now, 
whether at the, this open altar call or, Lord, that they would approach me later. Lord, I pray that we would go before you in prayer and bring that before you and place it at the foot of your throne. And Lord, there may be some here today that may not know you as their Lord and Savior. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would burden them, Lord, to place a weight upon their hearts that they would surrender themselves unto you. A simple prayer. Just a few minutes of your life to open up the door for a life eternal. This is our heart before you, Lord. And it is in the mighty name of Christ Jesus that I pray. Amen.